number of videos in which they put up on YouTube. And I went public for two reasons. One was really to say to people that your government is actually not being fully truthful with you. And secondly, there are an awful lot of people out there who go through um, very difficult experiences and they don't really have anybody to, to talk to. So I thought, well, if I can go and do that, then they will have somebody to, to uh, have a chat with and maybe help them get over their, their difficulties. So um, that's the history of, of when it started in terms of me going public with it and why I did that. Um, what, what is this it? Because um, if people don't know who you are or anything, Simon, because um, sure. a lot, lot of um, what I deal with, I don't know if you're aware of my work, I do a yeah, lot I've of... Seen it. Yeah. Yeah, so I do a lot of stuff within the law and uh, the legal yeah. sort of solutions to what's going on. But in, in case anyone doesn't know, explain sure. like um, what what this it is and who Amash are. Because I, I looked up who Amash are and it said um, anomalous mind mind management abductee contact helpline. But what a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit of a long title. Also, I'll, I'll let you go into detail of what this it is. <laughs> okay, well, it's not my organisation, and to be perfectly honest, if I was going to do an organisation, I would have a bit of a shorter name. However, there are two really good people. One's called uh, Joanne and the other one's Miles, um, two people who are very dedicated to investigating what I think people would refer to as extraterrestrials and UFOs. So it as you quite rightly pulled me up on, would be the subject of UFOs. Okay, because um, I've briefly looked over a few reports out there in um, things, the rags like the Guardian, and pulled things up. <laughs> and it, um, it was saying that you had some experiences. Yes. Um, it's interesting that you, you mentioned some of the newspapers. To be perfectly honest, the major media newspapers are uh, under very strict instructions what they can and can't print uh, and you will and your listeners will be familiar with how the media is controlled and is part of an arm of state um, a couple of the news media uh, companies or corporations outside of Britain are far more open actually um, but anyway uh, my grandfather um, who was a British consul he was a high-ranking uh, member of the diplomatic corps he was based at the British Embassy in India. He was uh, very highly decorated. He got the OBE, the MBE, the CBE. He was recruited as a member of what became MI6. And as a high-ranking mason, uh, he wielded an incredible amount of power. He was actually offered a knighthood to be Sir James Marsland, but he uh, fell out with the then Prime Minister and refused to have it. And uh, I think he sort of half walked out from his job as uh, in the British Embassy, but you can't ever walk out from the British intelligence services. So he was then appointed as Britain's ambassador to the United Nations, where he got involved in trade deals and things like that. Um, his daughter, my mother, um, worked for MI5, and her job was to type out documents that related to um, UFOs that had crashed. So I grew up in not in a military family, but I grew up in uh, an espionage type family um, where, you know, you had to be very careful what you said. You had to be very careful who you took as friends. Um, you were always looking over your shoulder. Uh, and it was a, an incredibly, looking back on it now, an incredibly... Uh, dynamic but very challenging time for a, a young boy to grow up and between 1971 and 1979 when my mother uh, worked for MI5 uh, that I'm aware of um, it was a, a roller coaster of a time um, and I had hang on I've had just to finish off because I know you asked a question I've had experiences with um, what you would call uh, off world beings ever since I can remember so uh, you've got this combination of coming from a very, very um, espionage, um, the arm of the state type environment, upbringing, and yet having these, these incredible experiences. Okay. So um, you, you just said um, that you've been remembering this stuff as far back as you can remember. Um, 
Yeah. How long have you been talking about it? And what made you start telling people about your experiences? 2010. I went public in 2010. It was picked up by media in 2000, end of 2010, beginning of 2011. And um, 2012, I was elected as a, a Labour councillor. What was the, what was the reason then? Because you must have been about fifty, um, two thousand and ten. Um, so what what's the reason for not not coming out in the public with this sort of in, until then? It's a good question. Um, when you experience things that school, the media, officialdom deny, then you have to question yourself and you think, well, you know, and I've been doing this ever since I was a young kid and hiding it in the back of my head and thinking, well, I've got to get on with my life here, you know, and forge a successful life, successful as, you know, it's looked at by the standards that we live in um, and be on and, and do what I need to do. And if I start uh, thinking too much about all this, it's going to really cause me to have to decide what am I going to do? Am I going to live a lie and pretend this never happened and don't mention it? Or am I going to be very brave and say the time has come to speak the truth, to let people know that the world that they live in isn't quite the world they think it is? So for about a period of three months, I went through quite a heart-searching time to decide what I was going to do. And then I finally decided that I knew that I would be attacked verbally in the press and the media, um, but I decided that it was the right thing to do because um, I wasn't prepared to hide the truth any longer. See, I, I, I've been doing a lot of work myself, it, looking into people like the Tavistock Institute, MI5, um, and how these departments um, do things on, on a completely different level, um, whether it be devices that uh, manipulate frequencies, um, whether they use mind control techniques and things like that. And well, with your own personal experiences, um, because you've experienced them, this is a debate that we were having uh, today, uh, because you've had this experience, does that necessarily make it um, true or not? Because um, some people can have... A, had an experience that they've seen um, God or the Messiah or something like that. So, it, and it doesn't necessarily make it, it true. So, is, it a, what, what, is there any evidence to back up what you've said? Well, again, that's a really good question. Um, before I just go on to that, you mentioned um, some of the techniques that the establishment use um, during the last sort of uh, few years in demonstrations in London. Uh, it was the policy to kettle um, demonstrators. And um, for those who don't know, that actually means that you round up a large number of demonstrators and put them in, a, in an area. Radio malfunction there. Probably, probably an interference. Right, it's, I think it's all right. Um, okay. Um, carry it's, on. It's not unusual for me when I'm talking about this subject for... Um, the radio station to go down either with power cuts or to have something beamed right across its frequency. Uh, that's a common occurrence. Um, yeah. You were saying about the demonstrators yeah. and you got to the point of kettling. Kettling. Yeah, kettling. The reason for that was that there are a number of helicopters which uh, the authorities use which are um, armed, I use the word armed, with a device which fires a, a frequency at a very calming rate. And the whole point about kettling was literally to bathe demonstrators in this special rays, which over a period of two to three hours would calm them down. But of course, that's totally denied and no one will, will talk about that. But I can tell you that's an absolute fact. I'll go back to, to, to the other question that, that you raised. Um, yes, there are an awful lot of people who, who declare they've seen Jesus um, or Mary. And who am I to say that they, they haven't? Um, I can hardly come on your radio show and say, I've seen this, but then I would then run down anybody else. Um, that's the old paradigm. I, I, I don't do that. I try and be as straight down the middle as I can. You ask for evidence. Um, I don't know if you saw any of the presentations. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that, or maybe some of your listeners might have attended 
some of my talks or perhaps seen on video. But um, last year I went to a shop, card shop, and uh, with my wife uh, to buy some discounted Christmas paper because it was in January. And lo and behold, there was a birthday card on the shelf in this shop with my photograph on it. And I had no knowledge of this. I'd given nobody permission to have a picture of me on this card. Um, and cut a, cut a very long story short, uh, having uh, gone to my solicitor, having traced it all back, it, it occurred that this photograph had come from America um, and the shop who had printed it, which was the card factory here in Whitby where I live, had only printed seven of these cards because they were supposed to be a test run. And of all the places in Great Britain that they could have sent these cards with my picture on, they just happened to send them to the shop that I live in. Um, and the uh, American company that had the copyright to this photograph refused to talk to me. So I went to the press, and I was actually front page on, on the local newspaper. And I did that deliberately to get the press to put this company in America under pressure to ask some questions. And the reply back was absolutely no comment. Now, I bought out seven of those cards, and I have those, uh, which I keep as evidence, because somebody somewhere in the intelligence service wanted to send me a message. And if you know anything about MI5 or MI6, they never do anything in the straight, open, honest way. They play a theatre game with you. Those cards with my picture on, they could have posted them to me or put them through the letterbox. But no, they wanted to put them into a shop where they knew I would go. So I've kept those cards. And when I do my talks or my, my um, presentations, I actually hand those cards around while I'm speaking so people can look at those cards um, and they begin then to see there's a bit of proof. Well, it's, um, it's a bit like, um, that reminds me of sort of techniques that Darren Brown would use. I don't know if you, you know who Darren Brown is. No, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, he's an, a mentalist, they call him. He, he, he's got high NLP skills. Um, and, it, and this is another point like, like I'd like to bring up. Um, I was interviewing a guy called David Shaler last year. And he's an ex-MI5 whistleblower who, right. who blew the whistle on the plot to kill Colonel Gaddafi. Right. But that's, that's another story. Now... He's um, a very active protester on the, the truther circles, as you could put it. Yes. And um, he says, like, 9-11 was an inside job. Yes. Um, he says stuff about common law. And then he s says over the top of that, oh, you must believe me because I'm Jesus Christ, whilst he's wearing a little skirt and a, a thong. And it's like all that credibility for some people could be taken mm -hmm. away. So the, the point I was trying to get to him was, um, how do you know that um, being XMI5 or being involved in them circles, that you, you don't, how do you know they've, if they've not tapped up you in the head some sort of a way or not? And, and much the same with yourself, with you having experiences, how do you know that this is not some kind of a mind technique or a trick that the government's pulled over your eyes to make you go out there and, and put this message out. C can you see that angle? Of course. And I would answer you by saying I don't go around in a little skirt and I don't go calling myself Jesus Christ. Um, I'm an elected representative of the people and English law is very strict that if you are insane you can't be an elected representative of the people they remove you. But hey ho, here I am doing my job as a local politician helping people to get the street lights working fixing the holes in the road, making sure their wheelie bins are collected properly. Um, you know, that, that, that's what I do. And because I do it well, and there's no criticism of me, there can't be. Um, I'm quite an enigma for, for the people who want me to be quiet. Um, it could well be that this gentleman, who I have no knowledge of, is very genuine. But if he's been got at and suggestions have been put True. in his head, then, then he, he's, he, he's very sincere, but he's, he's doing it and he doesn't realise he's not only ridiculing him himself, but unfortunately he's destroying the message. And these people who are in power, and my, my mother used to call them the powers that be, and that was back in the 70s, um, that's exactly what they would do. They would use uh, somebody who was inside to destroy the message. Yeah. Um, but, but is there, well, you know, I mean, this is what I'm saying to you. Your, mm. your experiences... 
Sure. Could, could they have been implanted using some kind of mind control techniques? The, the question that you would then ask is for what purpose? It actually doesn't help them if that was the case. It actually makes it harder because questions are then asked of them. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not their agenda. Their agenda is to be quiet. I mean, I don't know if your listeners are aware, but once a week, the President of the United States holds a press conference. It's part of the deal. Uh, he stands in the White House and for 45 minutes he's fired at questions. Do you know that there are only two questions you are forbidden to ask the President of the United States or, in his absence, his appointed spokesman? And that is questions on UFOs and questions on aliens. If a newspaper or reporter asks a question on that subject, then the deal is that the White House never speak to that newspaper or media corporation again. As a result of that, those questions are never asked. Now, if these things don't exist, why is the governments of the world so keen to bury them? And if, you know, taking your argument, what would be the point of having somebody who would come out who's got credibility um, and then start asking very difficult questions. So no, my, my experiences are real and very genuine. Um, I didn't have the sort of background I had for no reason. Um, there, there was, there was, it was a method in that. Okay, that, so would you like to tell the listeners like what, what the experiences have been as such? Because um, I don't think they know the full extent of sure. what, what you have gone through. Yeah, I, I can I can certainly do that, but I think because I've I've had a look at your your website and uh, I can see the good work you're doing, I've got a few little interesting snippets that that you and your your listeners might well be interested in. But before I go on to that, then yeah, I'm I'm quite happy to say that um, I think people I would like people to stop thinking in terms of um, aliens from space coming from millions and millions of miles away from distant planets and they take 50, 60 years to get here. Um, I'm sure in some cases that might be true, but my own experience is that is not the case. Um, no body who can travel from planet to planet that easily would use very old technology like that. So what, what we're talking about um, is what we call interdimensions, whereby you can um, go from one dimension into another dimension in a split second. You do not necessarily require to you know, go into hibernation or um, anything like that, deep freeze. You can just go from one to another. Science refers to it as a wormhole. That's the word they use. So there are a number of races. Um, everybody's familiar with the greys. That's a Hollywood favourite. There are other beings as well. Uh, I don't have a lot of contact with the greys. I don't particularly like them. I have seen them. Um, the beings that I see and I didn't know the name of them until researchers told me were called Mantid in America. They're referred to as Mantis and the Draconis Reptilians. Anybody fa um, familiar with David Icke and uh, his work will perhaps have heard of the Reptilians. Yeah. So um, do, you, do you get to choose when to contact these beings or do they contact you? No, I, I don't... Uh, I don't get the call on that. They will just come when they want. Um, at the end of the day, uh, they are the ones with the technology. They're the ones that call the shots. Uh, so, no, it's entirely up to them. And do you remember what's going on on these experiences? Yeah, most, most cases I do. Um, uh, usually you'll, I remember them as they unfold. On some occasions, I'll only remember part of what's happened. Uh, it's sometimes quite frustrating because if you imagine you went into a cinema and you saw a film but instead of seeing the whole two hours you only saw 40 minutes of it uh, you'd know what the, the genre was you know it was a western or a, or a spy film um, and you might know who, who the characters were but you wouldn't always know what the plot was and that's often the case when you're trying to bring back memories which are not completely formed So what happens on these journeys? Um, a great deal uh, and a whole range of stuff um, I I don't particularly have any experience of what some people refer to as space brothers and everything's sweetness and light. Um, do, do they just take your, your energy, your, your soul, or do they take your physical body? Or do they're, they capable of doing, they're capable of doing both. They can physically take your body, or they can take what is called the astral body. Um, 
and sometimes they do neither. Sometimes they will just materialize and then they will do what they need to do and then they will go. Uh, every time they come down and take a person, they don't just take me, they take thousands upon thousands of people. Uh, they leave themselves open to uh, detection by radar. They leave themselves open to interception, although in most cases they can't be intercepted. So they take a gamble, they take a risk every time they come down. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I won't have a contact for quite a while, and then, then there might be three or four contacts very quickly. It's, uh, it's, it's their call, you know, humans don't, don't dictate when they come. So what, what exactly do they, do they do with you, and um, do, you, do you know what they, they intend and what their outcomes are? Um, I appreciate it's difficult for anybody who hasn't got a knowledge of this subject and people tend to refer to them as, as aliens. Um, just as on, on the planet Earth, there are lots of different races. Uh, there are different groupings, and one group will have a completely different agenda to another. Um, most of the, the groupings do not get involved with humans. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an unwritten rule that you don't, get, you don't interfere. But there are a number of other groups which uh, do not abide by that rule, and it's their role to to be involved and for thousands of years they have been involved uh, the ancient Egyptian civilization prior to that the ancient Sumerian civilization um, they have been involved in, in humanity and they don't work generally with groups they work individually because um, you, you've said that this connection with your family is um, your mother isn't it your, um, did you have a, a physical mother and an interdimensional Mother, is that what I understand? Yeah, it, it, the, the, the establishment media, uh, the one particular newspaper locally that's owned by a mason who decided that he didn't like what I was saying because it was rather too near the truth, tried to politically destroy me, and of course it backfired. Um, and then my story went right around the world, America, Japan, every European country. Um, so they tried to put the story out that I have an alien mother. Well, I don't. Oh right! So you've never claimed this? Is this one of them? Um... Yeah, absolutely. What I what I what I've claimed is that the alien being wanted me to call it mother. Oh. It wanted me to say, "I accept you as my mother," but it was never my my mother. Otherwise, I would be a very different colour, and I would be much taller, which wouldn't be too bad if you were reaching things off the top of the roof. Um, but I'm very much a human bodied person. Um, but of course, the the Masonic. And the the Illuminati who control, you know, th this country and nearly every other country wanted to try to discredit me by saying he's got an alien mother. No, that's not what I said. Uh, so um, that's what I've seen on a few links. If people Google sign well, yeah, it, it says well, nine foot. Yeah, they will do because um, there are those people who are paid to debunk, and there are also people who don't watch it properly and they just grab a few bits and they grab the headlines. I mean, we all have very busy lives and sometimes we don't have the time to go through something 100% and as a result of that, we don't always get the full facts. Well, that, that, much like myself, I like to look in and out of information that, sure. and um, try and find out what my own truth is and it's not necessarily going to be the same as anybody else's and it doesn't necessarily make it right or not. Um, but this is where, where I find it like all interesting because like um, the little bit of information you sent me earlier with your family being involved with the MI6. Um, so I, I've never talked to you before and um, I do find this all very, very interesting. But what, what do you think the, the beings, these other beings that are visiting you, for example, and... and because I'll, answer, I'll, I'll answer your question. It's it's about genetics. The whole object of it is to create a hybridized race. Um, hum, the humanity is is very good at destroying itself or nearly destroying itself, and there is a, a reasonable probability that humans, sometime in the near future, might try and wipe themselves out. Um, and so there's been a great search for humans who have genetics which um, particularly appeal to them. Uh, I'm just like anybody else. I'm just an ordinary person. There's nothing special about me. I'm no better or no worse than any other person. I try and be good. I try and do what's right, um, but I'm not special. But to these beings, there's clearly something about me that does interest them, and I understand that they take uh, genetic material and they want to create a hybridized race. 
So, uh, when they've taken you, um, have, have they been friendly to you all the time? They've never hurt me once, and it's perhaps a very sad thing to say that uh, they've been nicer to me than many humans. Uh, I've never once been abused or hurt, um, although I appreciate that that's not the major story for most people. Most people who have had interactions uh, have some very difficult stories to tell. Uh, I've had some very, very uh, unpleasant things done to them. Um, I can't comment on that. I can only comment on my own experiences and... No, they've they've been fine. See, with my own personal experiences, I've um, never seen any creatures that I don't think are of, of this this world or even this realm. But um, I've had astral experiences. Um, but this is where I've, I believe the, the mind is a very powerful tool, and that when I've looked into a lot of conspiracies that are out there, um, whether it be chemtrails or um, UFOs. I was looking into UFOs years and years ago. I've seen strange things in the skies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, these beings are from other realms, um, and much as you say, uh, interdimensional realms. And it's something that is near enough impossible to um, prove, or, or even, well, to prove, because you couldn't disprove it. But if you have got information on this and you uh, talk about it, then you're going to get get attacked from many angles, whether it will be um, professional government trolls, which have probably attacked you, um, but even like just people who have got not, nothing better to do that will sit there online and attack all day long. And I've seen it time and time again, which makes a lot of people that are trying to put information out there stop doing it. And um, for myself, I like to just research to find out truth I couldn't agree with you more um, I agree with everything you said I'll, I'll give you an interesting um, topic here um, a year and a half ago a gentleman contacted me he was an ex-policeman and he was an ex-Ministry of Defence policeman and uh, he said he wanted to talk to me about Princess Diana's murder and I said, well, the first mistake you've made is say that right over the phone because <laughs> they'll be on to you. So I said, you still want to meet me? So he came and I thought we'd only have 30 minutes together, but we had about two hours and he gave me uh, what he knew uh, when he was uh, working in security and um, the pieces of the puzzle that he had quite nicely fitted with what I'd already been told. So I knew that he was genuine. About a week after he'd visited me, he was stopped by the police, I think in Derbyshire, or it could have been in Cleveland. Policeman pulled him over and said, I'm arresting you uh, for not having a driving licence for 28 years. So this guy, who was an ex-policeman, ex-Ministry of Defence policeman, sort of laughed at him and said, what are you talking about? And the cop said, no, I'm serious. We, we, you haven't got a driving licence and you've not held one for 28 years. So this guy was able to uh, pull all his documents out and say, look, I'm an ex-copper, at which point the policeman who in uniform sort of stepped back a bit and said, there's something wrong here, what's going on? Um, and this, this chap, he pulled out his passport and said, look, I've just renewed it and I used my driving licence to renew it. So the policeman obviously smelled a rat, realised he was being used uh, as some sort of trap. And he said to this guy, look, um, I'm not going to arrest you in fact, I'm just going to get in my police car and drive off. But I can't let you drive in your motor car because as far as DVLA are telling me, you've got no driving license. But he said, if you can get a friend to drive your car away, I'm just going to leave it at that. You can sort it out with DVLA and I don't want any part in it. And this was a sergeant. And I think it was lucky for him it was a sergeant because the sergeant had enough experience to know something was something smelt. Anyway, this person who'd blown the whistle regarding um, Princess Diana's murder to me, was not allowed to drive for three months. And he said to me, every morning I would phone the DVLA and ask them, well, can I drive yet? And there was no, no, I'm sorry, you can't drive yet. At the end of three months, he got a phone call saying, you're now authorised to drive. So it was a young girl on the other end, and he said to her, okay, can you tell me why? And she said, hold on a minute. And she 
pressed the keys on the computer and said, I'm sorry, the computer doesn't tell me that. So he said, okay, does the computer tell you why I've not been allowed to drive? And she pressed the keys and said, I'm sorry, it doesn't tell me that, but all it tells me is you now can drive. About four to five days after that, two people turned up, police officers, attempting to arrest him on a trumped-up charge. He went to court. The judge threw the case out. Two weeks later, they turned up to arrest him again, and now this person is on the run. He lives in a caravan, so I don't know where he is, and he drives around the country, all because he came to me to tell me about Princess Diana. And in one phone call that he made to me, he said, Simon, he said, uh, you piss them off. That's the word he used. You piss them off and they send you a birthday card. He said, I piss them off and they destroy my life completely. So that's the, that's the world that we're living in, um, where the truth that should be told isn't being told. And my experiences are just as much truth as the murder of Princess Diana. So, well, yeah, I've, I've just watched a documentary on um, Diana called Unlawful Killing. And um, that keeps coming down offline quicker than anything I've ever seen before. Uh, right. I don't know if you've seen it yourself, Unlawful no, Killing. But the funny thing is, it's made by um, Keith Allen. And uh, he's done a really good job on this documentary. He really has. He's asked all the right questions in the right places. Mm. And, um, well, it's just a bit undeniable. People like this um, don't die. And there is, um, you know what I mean? It's just not quite that simple. If, if the guy was drunk, for instance, he wouldn't be driving around um, Diana. It just, they would have got somebody else in it would have been known all this stuff but that's just another story um going back to like what what the races are and everything like that mm -hmm. um I, I was thinking earlier I, I heard you say uh on one of your videos that you don't like greys correct um i did think jokingly in my head being like um what you're a councillor of the labor party it's a little bit uh un pc on a uh, universal level, it's a bit racist. So, is there is a race? Well, what well, it's a race, isn't it? The greys. Yeah, but they're not human race. Mm, but so it can't be racist, can it? But then again, isn't a uh, the, the fish are a race? And um... no, the, the greys, the greys that I'm referring to, are what we call programmed life forms. And a programmed life form is a is basically nothing but a robot. So I don't like these beings because they don't actually live; they're robotic. That's why, I, that's why I hate them. They're not, they don't have a soul. They don't have a body and a, a life as, as you and I would understand. They are robotic. So, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to say I, I despise them. Oh, I was thinking of Greys as the more of, the, as you've said before yourself, the Hollywood term of um, little beings with big heads, big black that's right. eyes. Yeah, they're, they're the programme life forms. If you look at a drawing of a Grey, wherever it might be, if it's got what the Americans refer to as the big wrap around our eyes. So if the eyes go right around the back of the head almost, then researcher would refer to those as a programmed life form. If you see a grey being with small eyes, much more human-looking eyes, then that's not a robot. Um, and I refer to the programmed life forms. So are they actually living or are they lifeless? Um, they, they, they move, they animate, but they're not living in the sense that you and I would understand. Um, you could ask you, you know, you think about a, a computer. Uh, it doesn't move, but it does seem to think, doesn't it? Artificial intelligence. Well, imagine a race that's three, four, five thousand years more advanced than us. Imagine what they could do. So, what? what, what who made the greys then? Um, you mean who made the, the the robotic ones? Well, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, the race that. Again, researchers refer to as Draconis Reptilian. This is the shape-shifting ones, is it? Yeah, you, you, they are related to the shape-shifting ones. Um, if you study or look at anything that David Icke has written about, he's often on YouTube's absolutely full of it. Um, there are plenty of documentaries and talks about shape-shifting entities. And, yeah, they are, they are related. So um, don't they, the Draconians created the greys? They created the robot greys, yes. Um, is there a reason for this? Is there a war going on in the universe then? 
Um, the reason they were they were created is because they are very useful to have. It's, you think of a hospital, um, and you want people to 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 go around and do um, the very important jobs of of cleaning and moving the patients around, and then the the consultant surgeon, you know, he doesn't do that or she doesn't do that, but he or she walks around the ward and consults with the patients. In the same way, they created the program life forms to do all the menial tasks as they saw it, uh, what, which freed them up to do other jobs. It's just like having a robot around the house, but a, a much more uh, clever robot than just what you can imagine. So when these, um, be- these beings um, come to this realm or this planet, what, yeah. why, is it only, why don't they make themselves known en masse? Because if... Is there, is there a reason for this? Is there an agreement with the government? Or I, I asked that question of them, actually, about six to eight months ago, because that's something that really bothered me. And the reply I got was, well, how would that help us? What would we gain if we did that that we don't already gain now? It's a damn good answer. Um, if they put a spaceship, just like in Independence Day, over every major city, then every American with a sawn-off shotgun they're still allowed to keep their guns uh, would hide under the stairs and it would just um, be extremely difficult for them to do what they wanted to do so they operate in stealth because they do not want to be detected by the mass of the population somebody's just said on um, the chat that you're a channeler so do you you channel this information is it Uh, no I'm not a channeler Um, channeler is is somebody who um, can hold a two-way conversation um, almost psychically and uh, whilst I I can get messages partly that's not my gift no these things have to come to me and and basically communicate with me otherwise I don't pick it up so how how do they communicate because obviously it's not by today's standards of uh, text message or an email um I would be very suspicious if one of them picked out, pulled out a phone and started texting me. I would then think that uh, that was the biggest joke on earth. No, it's telepathic. They will actually just stand in front of you. Some of them don't even have vocal cords because after thousands of years of just using their mind, their vocal cords just disintegrated or just disappeared because if you don't use an organ of your body for a very long period of time, then it just, just goes away, shrivels to nothing. And some of these beings which are thousands of years uh, more advanced than we are will use telepathic communication and not verbal. Okay, so what? Um, do they, they let you know beforehand that they're coming to take you away? No. Um, what tends to happen is maybe 15 seconds before they, they arrive, uh, I must just feel something because I become quite agitated and sometimes very cross. Uh, and if I'm with somebody, then, you know, I, I tend to sort of bite their head off. Uh, but it's only literally 15 seconds before they arrive. So, no, I don't get any warning. No. So, like, you, you say you've had a, a lot of, of memories um, about this sort of stuff. Well, what, what would you say is some of the most interesting experiences you've had being taken away? Um I think some of the most interesting ones would have been shown um, from from a craft orbiting the Earth, watching. Um, and, and do you get to freely talk with these these guys, like when you're taken, or after after I've done whatever job they want me to do? Yes, um, it's like a reward, I suppose. Um, there'll be usually be a task that I have to do, um, and then after that period of time, there will be you know a, ta- a task as in what? What, what do you mean? Like get get you to do a job. There may be a piece of machinery that needs operating, but for some reason they want me to do that. Um, they may want a genetic sample. They may want to um, ask me about questions about the Earth. Uh, it's, it's usually something along, along those lines. And then there's the opportunity to discuss with them afterwards. And then you, you did interrupt me, so I'll just finish off the first question that you asked. Um, from, from space, uh, I have seen... Um, extraterrestrials for want of a better word actually monitoring all the communications on earth everything from from what's on the adverts on sky television right through to the most secret channels that moscow or london or new york or nato uh, will be using so they monitor all of the net of, of the earth and they know exactly what's going on that's how they can evade 
uh, American interception because they they know what the Americans are going to do almost before the Americans do it themselves. So it sounds like um, the Americans um, or even any government with their military hardware won't be able to keep up with the capabilities of um, what what they're able to do. Um, travel from here, physical dimension to another dimension is uh, going to outrun any missile, in my opinion. During the 50s and 60s, that was the prime reason for not disclosing to the public, because if the public realised that the American government couldn't protect its own people, then they felt that would bring a collapse of society. Um, since then, it's, it's moved on a little bit, because... Um, the, the major governments of the world do have some technology which is not being released to the public and those governments don't want you or, or anyone else to know exactly what they've got. So there are reasons why they're not coming clean up on the subject. Um, probably the, the biggest one, if this is all true, and I, I'm not going to say either way uh, myself, but if all this stuff is true, then um, these technologies that they can bring out uh, on this planet where people are pretty damn greedy... Uh, they'll turn the technology into commerce and um, people do wonder where certain technologies come from like the microchip, the CD and things like that and um, this will come out in Nevada desert close to Area 51 which is really old, old news compared to what the governments are able to do today but also another thing that I've looked into is people like Nikolai Tesla and he sort of worked and um, as, as far as I know, Nikola Tesla was a human who just used to think a hundred times more than like most people that I know today. He he um, was trying to create energy from zero point as, as such. I, I know that um, can't really be done. You need to get energy from somewhere to create energy. But it's another phenomenal thing from technologies on, on this planet gets suppressed therefore we don't strive forward and uh, I wonder if um, the, these creatures they've got compassion for us and things like that then why, why don't they make themselves known to, to the mass ok so the first point you, <coughs> you talked about Nikola Tesla there um, Nikola Tesla had invented a device which produced electricity very cheaply the problem with Nikola Tesla is he wanted to bequeath this gift to humanity. And uh, I, I remember if it was Central Power or Western Electric, one of the big American electric companies uh, fairly early on, uh, maybe the 20s, uh, was brought along to a demonstration. And Nikola Tesla showed this device producing electricity. And the only question this big, big American corporation asked was, where's the meter for the customer to put the money in to pay for it. And Nikola Tesla replied, I, I don't want people to pay for it. I want it to be free. I want everyone to have free electricity. Uh, that was the end of his project. Uh, there was a guy in 1957 who devised a motor car that could run purely on water. We call it hydrogen. And he went round this track at 57 miles an hour. And this is back before 1960. What happened was a big, big oil company came along bought out his patent, paid him for it, bought out the patent, and then promptly locked it away for all eternity. Um, there are a number of gifted people, and you call them humans, and they're exactly what they are. Humans are fantastic, can be very gifted, who either uh, invent something or reinvent something, rediscover something, only to either be murdered by the powers that be, or to be bought out in a common work for us, or to have their patents bought out and then put away. So, um, there are real issues uh, for, for humanity in terms of um, are you going to burn fuel, oil for the rest of your time? Because it either seems you're going to face to burn coal or oil or have nuclear power. And either of those resources in the end will kill you. See, that, that's the most plausible theory why they wouldn't let us know about um, alien or other technologies and things like this because um, they, they'd be able to capitalise on it. And, yes. Um, well, when you look at um, the technology that, that, that these beings could perceive to have, 
then nothing, well, there's nothing on this planet that could stop them destroying the planet, and they obviously are not doing that. So, um, are they are they using this planet to to farm humans? Some people say as a theory, and we're we're mining the gold on the planet for them, and that's another whole story. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of uh, these. You're definitely aware of the theories, but if they chat about it or not. Huh. I'll go back to your second question. Your second question was asking whether the um, extraterrestrials, we just call them extraterrestrials because that's what most people understand them as, whether they had compassion. That's the word you actually used in your second question, whether they have compassion for humanity. Um, the beings that I um, meet, I would say, are ambivalent. They neither one way or the other. Um, they're not really bothered. They have their own agenda. Uh, they certainly don't want to be uh, spotted. They don't want to be uh, found out because it will affect their agenda. Some some beings are mildly helpful to humanity. Some are definitely not helpful to humanity. Um, farming of humans, well, we haven't really got long enough on the radio show, but you know there are a number of people, <clears throat> and David Icke is one of them, who can tell you some really scary stories. Yeah, I wouldn't mind getting David Icke on the show one day. Uh, mm, that'd it's, be good. it's um not not something that I'm a big subject of, as you might be able to tell, but um I I do find all of these unexplained stuff uh more than interesting. It's it's something that I used to look into was one of the first things was UFOs and uh conspiracies surrounding it and um led me into things like uh, JFK and assassinations. And then when you look at Robert Kennedy, you, you go off on a, on a trail on researching and trying to find your own path. But hopefully, we're coming up to the hour now, and we're going to be okay. playing a couple of tunes. But if you can hang on and we have you back after the break, that'd be brilliant because there's many more things and questions that are coming up that people would love to ask. That's fine. I'll, <clears throat> I'll be here. Don't worry. All right, then. Brilliant. Right, we'll just roll into a tune then. Okay. Welcome back to the second hour with myself and Simon Parks. Um, tonight we've had some really interesting chats on uh, experiences or how would you word it as, uh, from an abductive point of view? I think experiences is the right way. Um, some people refer to themselves as abductees. That's a word that many people know. Contactees, um, I don't seem to fall into either of those two brackets. So I just say I'm an experiencer. I experience stuff and, you know, there we go. Because um, somebody else contacted me recently uh, and uh, a few other people contacted me. It's, it's quite strange how like, this is not a subject that I'm well known to be connected with. And uh, another one that claims to have experiences who wanted to come on the show tonight and uh, I was just going to bring him in the call so it could be like three people chatting away about uh, their, their own experiences on what is known to be the truth circuit and such uh, would you mind if I bring somebody in? No, I don't mind at all Right, we'll see how this goes Hello oh. Oh, that's good. It's not working too well. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. You're, you're breaking up on my end, Scott. I might have to stop you out of the call. Okay, I'll, I'll come back in in a second, mate. Once that. Uh, yeah, there's this guy there. Put your hand up and then call back in and then we'll see if that works because. Uh, Our connection seems to be working fine. Oh, that was really good. Thank you. Well, one is that. Oh, are you still there, Simon? Yeah, not going so well, is it? No, uh, well, it might actually be my laptop. I'm only using a little laptop, and it might not be able to handle bringing other people in. This is nice. all done um, in a radio station where we've yeah. been testing things out. Probably um, bandwidth. Yeah. Um, it seems to be working fine now with the pair of us in it, so we'll just yeah. carry on as it is. So like last week, um, we'd we done an interesting thing where we'd, we'd opened it up for callers, and um, that's one of the things we wanted you to come in with um, Bob of uh, Bob's Backyard, 
he's doing a two hour show after this where he has the whole of the Park City crew in and Bob says he could talk to you for hours on this subject because it's what he loves that's good what, what we're going to do is we're going to try and bring uh, Scott in uh, but in the meantime we might as well carry on talking about what we was before the break about um, mining of um, humans or farming and that is the theory that some people put out there that um, these aliens have hybrid uh, with humans so they can rule the planet yeah that's uh, not my take on it um, there's a very uh, decent guy in America who I think you could say was a contactee and his name is Alex Collier and in the 1980s he went public with his story and then he received a death threat I don't know if it was the CIA or the FBI <clears throat> but he got a death threat and he dropped out of the scene for maybe 15 years and then he decided to come back which is very unwise um, and did about two or three years of conferences but he, in the early days he talked about uh, missing children children all throughout the world who just seemed to have disappeared um, and he was linking that as David Icke does to the reptilian agenda and he came back and started the subject up and the next thing that anybody knew was that um, he'd had a, a lawsuit against him um, and they dragged up something from his past and he did a, an interview a year ago and um, he said, I'm just waiting for the power companies to cut off my electricity and my telephone because I'm penniless. Um, and that's what the system will do. If you go against one of their instructions, they will come after you. Just as the guy who wanted to talk to me about Princess Diana, he paid a very difficult price. He didn't lose his life, but he lost you know, everything he had. He, he had a home, he was married, and that all gone out the window. And people don't realise just how powerful the state can be if it chooses to do so. Yeah, and I suppose it is um, people that are in more powerful positions, they, they do come after. Um, but this, this is one thing. It's now there's a huge um, psyop war where all, all these things, these truths and information to me, I've, I've come to understanding myself that a lot of information is just put out there as either a distraction, people don't know where they're looking or what they're looking at and they get sucked into these realms rather than looking at solutions much the thing with um, chemtrails and geoengineering and this sort of thing, yes it, it might well be going on but at the end of the day uh there's no real solution to people's personal lives by looking into a, a conspiracy theory that could never be, be proved on, on my level, uh, is the way I see it anyway. So I, I look at the bigger picture of, I, I don't know, I, I think the bigger picture myself is um, beings on this planet that are controlling people through their manipulative ways, but... You're, you're, is it the people that are controlling on this planet? Are they connected to this reptilian agenda? Is is that the understanding? Well, well, the first thing I'd say is that the, the word conspiracy theory <clears throat> was a word that the paid debunkers used, and they brought it out in the late 1990s in order to try and sow seeds of disquiet amongst the ordinary people. And now it's uh, it's really part of our lexicon, isn't it? We'll often say. Oh, it's a conspiracy theory, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> Princess Diana's death <clears throat> is often described as a conspiracy theory. And unfortunately, the word conspiracy theory is a very negative, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very negative connotation, often used by people who wish to discredit or, 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 or bring about um, somebody trying to bring their truth out. Um, you're quite right. Um, there are plenty of people on this planet who wish to control everybody else. And you only got to go to a high street bank. Um, I mean, I have a, a good friend, member of the family, who is a banker in the true sense of the word. And he wouldn't let me buy a drink. We went to, to the pub and he said, no, he said, I'm one of the people that's put this country in the mess it is. Why the hell should you have to pay for this? I won't let you pay for anything. I'm going to. Buy. So he was a good guy because he realized that he is responsible partly <clears throat> for what had happened. But there are plenty of people out there who 
um, don't give a tuppenny hay damn about the rest of this and will just fleece us left, right and centre. Um, and there are a lot of people in power who, once they get to the top, they will fight tooth and nail to stay in that position. Um, they're as corrupt as hell. And, you know, the time is coming where I think ordinary people need to band together and say enough is enough. We're not going to put up with it. So, you know, I, I, I applaud what you do because I think that you get the message out there that the way the world is turning, and particularly in Britain, um, the way that uh, a lot of the what I'd call semi-police forces like um, parks police and the wardens are having official powers given to them so they can actually act as a real police constable. The fact is, your listeners will know, Britain has got more CCTV cameras than I think nearly any other country in the world. And it's been done by stealth. Slowly but surely, people's liberties are being taken away from them. And the people in power and deliberately doing this. It's part of their agenda. Uh, and I just wish more people would realise how they are losing their freedoms. But, yeah, no, I'm totally with that, because I, I see the government um, casting their spells every day, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even with that word government, to uh, govern means to control, and meant uh, could be literally translated as mind, which is mind control, and this is what they do. Yes. But... These, uh, I'm seeing humans controlling humans. It might be sick, sick uh, psychopathic humans, but mm. nevertheless, um, I, I don't see the, the connection with... Um, oh, there's, there's not enough for myself evidence to say uh, that... These governmental bodies are. I, I understand. Well, I understand your question. I, no, I, I, I understand your question. Um, if there was enough evidence, then they really wouldn't have done their job properly. If there was enough evidence out there for decent, like-minded people who don't have the interactions that I have, don't work in MI5, don't work in MI6, and don't work in the top echelons of the military or the police force um, if they ever found out well then someone's not doing their job properly because the whole object is to keep the truth from the ordinary people the attitude and i know this from from my family background the attitude is that ordinary people aren't clever enough or adult enough to cope with the real truth that that's that's the official view the official view is the public don't have a clue we need to keep them in that mindset, in that frame of mind, because we can't trust the public to make the right decisions, and therefore we will make the decisions for them. Um, and through the Masonic uh, system, through those members of the Masonic order, uh, it is the Masonic, the top branch of the Masonic order, which if you look on the internet, it's called the Illuminati. That's not actually correct. There is a dark Illuminati, an, an evil Illuminati, and there's a good Illuminati. And there's, in fact, a group in the middle who just sit at their books in their libraries, do their studies, and don't get involved. But it's the dark Illuminati, above the 33rd degree from the Masonic system, who um, have had uh, experience of these beings, who have been shown, you could call it dark arts, dark magic. They've been given special abilities or skills but in return, they've had to sell their soul. And what I mean by sell their soul is they have to do what they're told. So these entities or some of these entities control a lot of humanity through key players. Um, so if you're a multimillionaire, uh, you can influence politicians. Uh, you can influence the media. You might have stocks and shares in big companies and you can get them to do what you want. Well, those are the people they're after because they wield immense power. And on this world, money is power. I could never understand why a man who works in a bank uh, and has defrauded this country of billions of pounds, why he gets paid more than a nurse in a hospital who might save the life of a five-year-old kid or an old-age pensioner. Why does this system value uh, a man in a bank over a nurse? The whole thing is on its head. And until humanity can actually get a grip of this and sort it out, it's just going to get worse and worse. I, I totally agree with you because um, education is backwards. Um, it keeps people dumbed down. The food that people have to buy nowadays rather than um, pick it naturally is 
um, far from food. Most of it has got poisons in. Um, the water's even got poison in. Everything is backwards. And I, I think it does start with education. This is all owned by the government, government run, and we will tell you how to think. And I, I'm pretty damn sick of that, personally. I you know? agree. I agree. So that uh, I'm still intrigued on your, your visitations and um, what actually happens uh, okay. whilst, whilst, whilst you're taken. And um, well, tell me some of the experiences of, of things. Okay. Yeah. All right, why not? Um, I'll do an early one. Uh, it's one that I, I do use um, when I do my presentations. Um, 1971, so I would have been 11 and three quarters of years old. And I think it was either a Saturday or a Sunday. I wasn't at school, so it was obviously a, a weekend. And I lived in Brighton, <coughs> which is in East Sussex. And two doors down uh, was another house, and it divided into flats. And there were two separate families. And what I used to do is go and call for the kids there, and of a weekend we'd go over the park and play. And on this particular time I'd called for my friends, and I can't even remember their names. Uh, <coughs> I was the only boy, which was quite nice for me. Uh, Sharon Lendrum. Tammy Lendrum, Adrian Atkins, Chloe Atkins, and Melissa Atkins. So three girls in one family, two girls in another. And we went over the park, as we usually did. Um, and we only just been there two or three minutes, and then I can't remember which one of us it was, but we saw this object in the sky. It was silver, teardrop-shaped, uh, the blunt end going forward and the pointy end at the back. No windows, no sound, moving very slowly. And... And when it drew level with us, it was about a quarter of a mile away. Uh, I don't do meters, I'm afraid. It was a quarter of a mile away and probably about 400 um, yards off the, off the deck. It turned towards us and came almost over us. And as it just before it came over us, it turned again away from us, uh, went along a bit, turned away again. And we watched it in probably between 12 and 15 minutes. And it disappeared over the horizon. And as soon as it disappeared over the horizon there was a propeller sound to my left and there was a bright red biplane. Uh, right, it looked really old-fashioned, but there were three enormous cameras, one slung from either side of the wing and another one on struts above the pilot's head. They were huge cameras. Uh, and this thing was clearly, clearly, um, you know, attempting to film this. Um, and it had gone round and... I had memories of being in at that stage. I had memories of being inside this spaceship. And at the next thing I knew, we were all walking back and chatting about what was that, you know, and some of the girls were saying, oh, it looked like a shooting star. But then the other one said, yeah, but it didn't hit the ground. It was flying. And I'd said, well, you know, what about the people up there? And they looked at me as if I was mad, you know, what people? And I said, well, the people up in the spaceship. And it became apparent to me at that point that I'd had an experience that I remembered some elements of it that they clearly hadn't been part of. And what I, I remember was actually being taken off the ground. And the way I describe it is if you stuck a great big industrial vacuum cleaner on your chest and you were felt a great pulling sensation and I was literally I felt like I was pulled off the ground um, and as I flew towards this thing I could see the silver wall of it the, the edge of it all metal beautiful shining silver in the sunlight and I thought oh my god how am I going to get through that bloody wall and I had no memory of getting through it the next thing I know I'm standing in what I can only describe is very similar to a cross channel ferry so open plan um, and there are um, beings and people but the beings are at a distance but all around me are people and children there are plenty of children lots of um young children there but they're all girls and i'm the only boy uh, to cut a long story short uh one of these uh, beings comes up to me and i'm hysterical i don't i've never been embarrassed to say this i was absolutely screaming i was crying not a single person there took the blindest bit of notice. Nobody came up to help me. They all just kept right away from me. And then this creature, best way to describe it really, comes up to me and puts his hands on my shoulders and then calms me down. He doesn't speak with his mouth. He sends a telepathic message, which is, no one's going to hurt you. Don't be scared. You're not alone. You will never be harmed. And then when I got karma, um, he offered what 
researchers refer to as a soul agreement. And this is where uh, I'm privileged enough to remember making an agreement, a bargain is what I always called it, but researchers call it an agreement. I made a bargain with them. They offered me something and I agreed to that. And from 1971, I've always realized that I was never taken against my will because I agreed to let them do what they need to do. Uh, and that empowered me because so many people either don't have that agreement or can't remember it. And as a result of it, the typical abduction scenario is a person seeing a bright light in the sky. They're frozen. They can't move. They're taken up into a spacecraft. They're prodded about on an operating table and they're unceremoniously dumped back on the bed and these people when they contact me you know to talk it through and they say to me they don't speak to me they don't communicate i feel so like a victim because i don't know what they're doing and i actually asked the being that usually comes to collect me why on earth don't you talk to these people because you, you you're really upsetting them and his view was they shouldn't be remembering anyway you know, we don't communicate with them because they're not supposed to remember. So what's the point in talking to them? Um, and in those, those, those people's point, obviously, whatever conditioning they were under was breaking down because they were getting memories back. Um, and a lot of the, the trauma that people suffer is because they only have partial memories and they don't understand what's happening to them. Um, just to wind up, really, I, I, I've always been fortunate because there for the grace of God go I, I suppose, um, I've always understood what it was about. So I've been empowered and I've never felt victim. But I understand that I'm, I'm the minority. Most people get a rough end of the stick. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in, but, but did, did these people that you was with um, when you was young, did they experience this craft and see it as well? Yes, they did. Absolutely. When they went back, uh, the, 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 the actor's family... Their father was a very, very strict Catholic, and he was—he absolutely went berserk. And he said, "You're not ever to talk about it again," um, you know. Uh, and he made them go to church, and they had to do hail marys, um, and he wouldn't have it. The other family went back, um, and they were Greek, uh, Greek extraction, and they dismissed it. Um, they. They just said it was just a star that they'd seen. Now, when I went back and told my mother, she just nodded her head and said, yeah, that's probably what it was. But she said, don't talk about it to other people, but we will talk about it. And she asked me to draw it, and I did the drawing of it. And she said, well, I'll show it to um, the guy who was from MI5 who used to come and give her the documents. His name was Paul Dunlop. And she said, I'll show it to Paul um, because Paul would want to see this. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's... A little snapshot of an experience I had when I was young. And there's a few questions coming in, like, um, do you think chemtrails have got anything to do with UFO activity? Are you a Mason? Um, and the police officer regarding Diana, um, if if the police officer went to court, mm. um, what, what was the charge that he went to court for? So three questions. Um, Right, the first question is about chemtrails. <clears throat> yes, chemtrails are. Um, lots of people think that chemtrails are there to poison humanity. Okay, that's, that's, that's the story out on the web. It's actually not correct. Because if you think about it, the people who are spraying the chemtrails, they've probably got wives and children, and they're down on the ground. They wouldn't be spraying to kill themselves off. The people who are the elite, they wouldn't kill themselves off. The... The particles in chemtrails are designed <clears throat> that when you shine a holographic beam against them, it will project an image. And what they've been doing is spraying certain parts of the world, and then from spy satellites, they've been monitoring how long this um, suspension lasts in the atmosphere. Um, and they'll look at the type of winds, the type of cloud pattern, and they'll get a, what we could call a window of opportunity um, when it's uh, preferable to shine. If you wanted to shine an image, a false image up onto the sky, let's say I wanted to have a false flag alien invasion and I wanted to shine uh, a picture of a spaceship up in the sky, which wasn't real, but I just wanted to do it. And we'd need those materials floating in the atmosphere to get a good holographic image back. So that's what the chemtrails are. Um, I don't know if I can do this in order now. No, I'm not a mason. Um, I, uh, 
I have no problem with the Masons. I have a problem with the top echelon of the Masons. The Masons do actually a lot of good um, for for local people. My grandfather, when he was a Mason, he personally, um, him and one other, built a school for girls in Lancashire. Um, and, that, and back in the 1920s and 30s, there weren't many girls' schools, and girls' schools were very poorly equipped because in those days, boys were everything and girls were nothing. And he, he actually funded a built a school. So we can't say Masons are bad. Masons are good. It's the top echelon, the people who have the extreme power. What was the third question? It was to do with the police, the, um, the police officer that spoke about Diana. Yes. What was the, the court case? I, I, I don't know because he, when he realised that his phone call to me had been monitored and he wouldn't be the only one, um, he got particularly scary. Uh, he said to me, I, you don't mind, he said, if I never visit you again. He said, I'll ring you from around the country on my mobile, but I'll only keep to within 30 seconds. Um, you can be traced by mobile very quickly. You only need, it, it, you know, you see these films, these detective films and they're, on the phone and they say, did you manage to trace them? And they say, no. Well, I'm afraid that's not very good because you can trace a, a digital phone within two to three seconds. Um, so what he would do is he would give me a, a 15 to 20 second phone call then dry, jump in his caravan and drive off 20, 30 miles. Um, I never found out what the court case was. Um, uh, I would assume that it would be something fairly mundane and the object was just to make his life an absolute misery. So what, what was the police officer's name? Uh, John Twyman. See, I've given you a name. Um, Twyman. It's, what's your favourite um, 9-11 theory? Is it Fermi? Is it holograms? Theory. Theory. Uh, do you know what? I don't do theories. I do truth. Come on in. Um, I'll tell you what it is. Um, the explosives that you can quite clearly see uh, blowing out the white smoke and the hot sparks. Uh, that was used to cut through all of the supporting cables. Um, the television companies, I'm afraid to say, were all in on it. And anybody who takes the time or has the time in our busy life to actually do any of the research, you can do it on the internet. All these people who supposedly were independent witnesses, eyewitnesses who phoned up all the media companies. I was standing on whatever street and I saw this. Unfortunately, as to my knowledge, only one of them was a genuine independent person. Everybody else either worked for the government or for a media company. Um, so I have no doubt that the Twin Towers were brought down deliberately. Uh, again, if, if your listeners have the time, they can go and find out that prior, about four to five weeks prior to the towers coming down, the Twin Towers were insured against an aeroplane crashing into them, but only if one tower came down. Do your, do your listeners know that five weeks or so before that, that insurance was changed so that if both towers came down, then the guy who owned the towers got all his money? So the, the, the trails are there if we can, if we can find them. Um, yeah, explosives were brought or used, and I think... The last thing that a security uh, chappy had told me was something like 1,027 cars, buses, fire engines, what have you, were burnt out around the, um, the base of the Twin Towers. And when you actually look at them, you'll find every piece of plastic has actually been melted. Um, a, a building collapsing doesn't do that, even if it's on fire. But if you use these high-tech explosives then they create an incredible amount of heat. And um, these uh, actors and things like that, I saw something online the other day that was pointed out to me called um, crisisactors.org. <laughs> and this is actually, um, they've done, and it's all there clear, but they've taken a lot of information down uh, regarding certain actions that look like it's exactly like Sandy Hook and things like that. Okay. But it looks like that there are these uh, multitude of companies out there that send actors in and things like that on these media sort of like stunts. Um, even on protests, they send actors in. You'll, you'll see that they do the script over and over again. Mm. And um, 
this is something that I, I can't get my head around is um, staging stuff. I like to do stuff mm. off the cuff and see how it sort of like pans out. Mm. Um, right, I'll just see if there's any other questions. Oh, somebody said a question earlier, but uh, got a mistake. I, I was calling you an MP when you were actually a, a councillor. Yeah. But um, do you know anything about Agenda 21? Um, yes, to a certain extent. I mean, is that all the question? Is it just says, do I know about Agenda 21? Well, the question was, do you know the agenda behind the agenda of Agenda oh, that, 21? That, 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 makes, that makes much more sense. Um, yeah, that's what I would expect the question to say. Um, going, going back maybe 20 years, um, the elite of a number of countries decided that they wanted to control humanity in a set way. Um, and we're talking about depopulating the, you know, depopulating the earth, um, different ways of controlling people. And unfortunately, the internet uh, hasn't caught up with with the latest. The latest is that you don't need to control humanity in the traditional way. Um, the idea is, hopefully, for them in the next few years, they will microchip every living human on the planet. And before that sounds too crazy. Let me just tell you that this year, 2013, is the year that Great Britain goes live with you chipping your mobile phones to pay at shops. They trialled it, um, it's no secret, they trialled it out in London and New York and a couple of other places. And you go into your supermarket, let's say you get £20 of whatever, you know, your, your vegetables or whatever it is you eat, and then you don't get your credit card out, you just put your mobile phone down on the reading plate and it says, yep, you've got a bank account, yep, you've got some money in there, and it takes the £20 out. Very good. Uh, I don't think the credit card companies are going to like it because it's the death of the credit card. It's also the death of cash. Anyway, that's by the by. So they'll do that for a little while, and then they'll say, you know what? You're so used to putting your mobile phone down on this reader plate. Why don't we put this chip in your hand? then it doesn't matter if you lose your mobile phone, you'll still have your chip. And you're so used to, your, you know, you're, you're going around with your mobile phone in your hand, it's, and not, you know, it's the way of the, way of the world, and I'm just as bad. I go out and my phone's glued to my hand. So you're used to putting it down on this plate. We'll make it easier for you. Um, but not only that, we've got the technology now, this chip. You can actually put your TV on with it. You can open your, close your garage door with it. Um, and we'll put your bank account through it. And... If humanity goes for that and they're chipped and then somebody comes on your radio show, OK, um, and they make an anti-government statement, well, all that happens is their chip is turned off. You don't need to have a violent protest. There won't be police knocking on your door. Won't or, necessarily be turned off because then they won't be able to make money out of you. I think they'll just fine people a little bit. No, they, they will turn it off because if you are... Um, but wouldn't that make people get more productive for themselves? Like, if it, this is the whole reason why I've been trying to step out of the system more and more is to learn skills in case that system collapses. Yeah. Now, um, if they did turn these chips off, yes. Um, the people are have still got a, a touch of humanity left in them, yes. and they would like look after their elderly if need be if their chips were turned off or, or, or whatever, yeah. and. Um, I, I just can't see them depopulating. I can't see uh, because they've got great control over the masses anyway by a uh, very minority group. But um, depopulating, I'm not too sure about uh, because they've got everyone to be compliant and follow them. And uh, the masses probably would accept the RFID chip because it would seem safer to carry all your banking details in a little microchip just under your fingertip. And then you can swipe your way through life. There'll be the adverts and uh, Beyonce will have one in her backside to advertise it. But it's, uh, it is all coming. And I see things stepping that way with things like Bitcoin. Do you know what this Bitcoin is? Yeah. The, prob the problem is that if humanity does that, it's finished. Because I know you, I hear your argument um, and you hear about making money. Do you know what? They've made so much money out of people. They've got so much money. Um, that a few thousand people or a few hundred thousand people who have their chips turned off, so what? They just go and print more money. 
it, 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 it doesn't make any difference. If there's 200,000, 300,000, a million people whose mm -hmm. chips are turned off, well, for the loss of economy, they just go to the Fed, FedEx Reserve and say, okay, just print extra amount of money to replace the million people whose chips we've just turned off. Yeah, but turning the chip off doesn't necessarily mean they'll die. They'll no, it doesn't. But what it will happen is they'll come, they'll come crawling back on hands and knees saying, please forgive me. Uh, or they'll learn skills where they won't need the chip. Well, they could do, but um, high-powered guns are going to be banned in America. The second deal you're going to get is um, automatic pistols. This is a pistol that instead of having to squeeze the trigger each time you send a bullet out, it's just an ordinary pistol, but you hold the trigger back and it automatically fires. There's usually 16 bullets in the mag mm. and one in the pipe. That's the next weapon that's going to be banned. I was chatting to a, a colonel um, general who said to me, if there's an altercation and you've got a handgun and I'm outside with my high-powered weapon, you've got to come to the window to shoot me, but I don't. I can shoot right through the walls because these bullets from these guns will go right through the walls and kill you. And this is why they want this particular weapon or these types of weapons out of the hands of the citizens in America because they can um, not equally fight but they could cause the military a serious problem. And they don't want people in the future who've had their chips turned off having access to high-powered weapons. So what I'd ask your listeners to do is to not look at this thing as, as a fractured, um, uh, disparate piece, but it's all working out. What, so do, do you they think... Um... Plan one thing after another. It's been planned out years ago. One thing falls in slot after another. Once they get something through, they then put the next thing through. And joining the EC, that was part of it. Oh, hello. Hello there, John. Hello, Simon. Oh, you're in the call. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Um, no, right, welcome to the show. We've just been flying for everything from 9-11 to UFOs. Do, do you want to introduce yourself, Scott? Uh, yeah, certainly. I, I'm Scott. Um, I've, I've had some experiences myself, um, similar to Simon, but different, should we say. Um, yeah. I, I've known Simon. I've known Simon for quite a while um, since uh, the new fun uh, group, Simon. If you think that opus, new fun. And yeah, new, new fun. Uh, mutual UFO network. Um, yes, they, America. A, that's right. They did a support group for. Um, people have had experiences, so uh, that's, that's where I first met Simon. Um, you're, Simon, can I just say, your the information you've got since I first met you is incredible, because um, you didn't know anything when I first met you. You were looking for a, for a uh, hypnotherapist, a good hypnotherapist, so um, kudos to you, mate, on the amount of information you've managed to, um, to glean. Um, I, I just want to also say, Simon, um, my... my my experience seems to differ somewhat from yours. Um, am I still there? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just sit yeah. back and listen to you. Well, what, what was okay. your experience? My, my experience is... Um, my experience... Uh, they've been a, it's, it's been a paradigm shift, to be quite honest with you. I, to tell you the truth, I do not know what it is I'm dealing with. I can't deny something's occurring. There was lights in the sky. Me and my son had two hours missing time. Um, we've had... Um, entities, beings, projections, whatever you want to call them, I don't care, but they were there. Um, we've seen them. Um, I've also, during the missing time, I've had uh, memory recall, but obviously, because this is missing time, I can't locate the memories. If that makes you said sense. you've had memory recall, what? Is this... Um... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like fuzzy pictures. Um, fuzzy pictures, um, being told things. Um, but the thing is, it's it's almost lucid dreamlike. Um, it's uh, I would say it's um, oh, crying out loud. Um, well, you, let, me, let me tell people how you contacted me. You you, okay. you contacted me after I'd done a show, and I said about um, uh, techniques of mind control, and people have said, "Well, Dom's part of the Tavistock Institute." Well, if I am, they've done a number on me because I don't know it, and. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like I can't say yes or no whether they have tapped me up in the head. And that's where I'm pretty open to this sort of information and listening from many different angles. So carry on, Scott. 
Yeah, and, and that's, this is exactly where I've come from, Dom. Um, I, I'm coming from a position of I've had missing time. I've been messed with, whether it be with aliens, interdimensionals, extraterrestrials, or military. I don't know, mate. I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not going to turn around. I'm not going to start putting my finger and saying it was this, it was that, or it was the other. Because if it was military, they could quite easily make me think that it was aliens. So, I mean, for me to turn around and throw all of my women cards or all of my eggs into one basket, I'm not going to do it. So, um, that, that's, that's where I am, mate. I could quite easily be mind-controlled. But if I have been mind-controlled in any way, what's happened to me since it has um, kicked off is an awakening. It's a, it's a severe awakening. It's been, I've been woken up to the control system that is around us. I'm not going to turn around and make any claims whatsoever that I'll expect a single individual to believe because this is more truth. These are my experiences. I've got witnesses. I've got photos. I've got films of UFOs. I've got I've got um, photos of the marks that I've been returned with. Well, you've got videos you've done yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these are all things. And I mean, the the thing is, is that uh, the the commentary over the video is more <laughs> it's more um, fascinating than the video because you'll hear my kids talking and this this. <laughs> I, I can't deny it. I can't deny that these things are happening. What they are, um, it's it's in for the debate, mate, to be quite honest with you. I'm, I'm not going to put my finger on anything. The thing is, Simon, you're giving information, all right, as fact. And the, the reason, you, I, I don't know why you're giving it as fact, because some of the facts, surely you can't know. I mean, how can you know this? And how do you know that you are not being mind-controlled yourself? These are the little questions that I need to ask you, Simon. And, and one more thing, mate. How did you get your memories back? Because if, if you've got your memories back so easily, tell me how I would like to do it. Hmm. Shall I uh, answer? Please, first, of all, first, first of all, say um, I think Scott is one of the nicest people that I've ever met. Um, I met Scott <clears throat> when I was accepted by an organization called MUFON, which is based in America. There was no support network in Britain at that time, and it's a terrible crying shame that people who have these experiences have to go uh, via internet to America to be taken seriously and to um, meet other people uh, who have had similar experiences. So that's where I met Scott. Um, when, I, when I met Scott, uh, I was in a, a... I think I talked about this a little bit earlier before Scott came on the radio... It was for a period of time where I was unsure whether I should uh, progress further and decide that I wanted to be truthful or whether I wanted to keep burying uh, my memories. I had about 20%, all the memories I've got now, probably 20% of those I've carried with me since I was a child. As I approached my 50th birthday, um, then quite a few came back, not necessarily all in one go. Um, they usually come back during the day, um, stimulated by a sound on the radio or maybe my wife will say something or uh, there'll be a bright colour. And those memories came back um, quite, quite dramatically. And what I used to have to do was just literally sit down, wherever I was, and grab a piece of paper and a pen and just make notes very quickly. Because what I found within 15 to 20 minutes of those memories coming back, they got a bit confused. So I, I knew I had to put them down very quickly. To answer the second question about truth, um, I, I tell people what I have been either, uh, I've either seen with my eyes or have been communicated to me. Now, what Scott's actually saying is, how do you know that what you're, you're telling us, it's your truth, but how do you know that's the truth that you've been given? Well, all I can do is tell you that that is what I've been told, and I don't see the agenda. If it was to debunk our subject, if it was to um, say everything was uh, just people mad or crazy, I can see why the military, the my labs, we call them, they would want to do that. But to actually say, well, you know what, um, extraterrestrials are real, it, it doesn't actually go with the, the debunker's normal agenda. Um, so I, I no, would... no I, I, do, I do agree with you there, Simon, but I mean, what, what it tends to, tends to have us doing is, I mean, if someone experiences lights in the sky and then has missing in time, with everything that the TV's told us for our life, with everything that we've seen and we've been programmed to think, our immediate reaction is aliens, okay? So I jumped out of, well, I didn't jump out. I had my box torn apart, mate. 
Um, I had my reality literally torn apart. I found it very difficult, as you well know, um, to to sort of, to carry on, to carry on doing anything. Um, so I had this, I had this, this box torn apart. And then all of a sudden, everything's possible. And I'm like, my word, what's going on? And I dive straight into the alien box. And I was, I was like most of the abductees and most of the experiencers that couldn't take their eyes off of the stars to see the truth of what's happening around them. Um, and it, it seems to me that it's a story being fed, that it's constantly, constantly being fed. Now, I don't say that it's wrong. I don't say that there's no such thing as aliens. My word, what a, what a stupid statement to make. What I'm trying to say is, is that we can't close our mind off to other, other possibilities. I mean, the second we close our mind off is the second that we're a lazy mind. I mean, only a lazy mind would settle for a belief. That's a, that's a mind that doesn't want to keep looking. It's a mind that's um, fed up with searching. And it's a mind that's settled on a truth, whatever the truth may be. So this is, this is my philosophy on it anyway. Um, I don't want to lead other people who might be having these sort of experiences, experiences down a dark alley. Um, I would rather say, look, because if I, if I, for example, if I took Dom to a ship and I pre presented um, Dom with the side of the ship and then took him away and then I took you to a ship and I presented you to the front of the ship and then took you away, I said, right, draw, draw me a ship and you would draw something that was um, tall and, and narrow and Dom would t draw something that was long and short but and it'd be like, hang on, that's not, they're both a ship, but I've just shown you it from a different angle. The thing is, we've got to walk around all of these possibilities. We can't just say, that sounds right, I'm going with it. Because what are we doing to the other people that follow in our footsteps? I mean, we're doing our experiences no justice whatsoever by turning around and settling on answers that we do not know are true. That, that's where I'm coming from anyway, um, Simon. I, I, I apologise if, if, if you see it. Your way and you are 100%. That's entirely down to you. You're, you're rightful to have your own reality, mate. But Can I, I interject that. for a little bit of uh, clarity? Um, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Simon, when, when was the last time that you, you got, uh, or the last time, few times that you've had these interactions? Have they been in the last couple of years? Uh, about two weeks ago. Okay, and, and does this happen with telepathy? No, it can be either. It's generally when they come visit me. Okay, and um, you, you've had these telepathy sort of things from a child, and this has been happening at every point. Um, so, what point did your memories come back? Like, well, what, what, how, you know, I mean, at some point, were they suppressed, or when did they come back? Because if they're doing these techniques from the age of, did you say around eight or something, was it your first memory? No, earlier than that. 1963 would be when it really kicked off. So I'd have been about three and a half to four years old. Okay, so like um, from then, there's been multiple contacts all the way through. Yeah. So. And, and what, I, I, can, I can say. That what points I, are your memory I, missing and how did it come back? Sorry, I, I, sorry Scott, what did you say? No, no, don't ask the question. I, I can agree with you on that part. I, I've, had, I've had similar through my life, but I'm not. Sorry, carry on, Dom. Well, did, did you remember your incident um, near enough straight after as such that you had some kind of contact? Of course. That's why, that's why I cope with it much better than most people because I have grown up through my life um, understanding a little bit more than, than many. I feel, I, feel I, can, I can't understand because I've not been in that position, but my heart goes out and I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being absolutely genuine. My heart goes out to people who are older and suddenly then their memories come back and they've had nothing before to go on. And they're suddenly shocked that they have to face this reality. And it's not the reality of the world they've been happily living in. And it completely turns them upside down. They were happy to go to work. They were happy in their relationship. And suddenly, all those things that they held dear, they just aren't dear to them anymore. And it completely turns their world upside down. In my case... Ever since I've been a small boy, I've been aware of these, these creatures. Um, I mean, I used to talk to my mother about it, and I used to say, the funny men are coming again. But my mother knew about these things. When I was three and a half, four years old, I had chicken pox. And um, I was off nursery, didn't go to nursery school. And I remember being in bed in the morning with a big glass of water and a water jug. And my mother, this will shock people, 
I'm three and a half years old and my mother's saying, right, I'm going to work. I'm going to leave you alone. Don't worry, I'm coming back at lunchtime and I'll do you some food. But they will look after you. They will look after you. And I was three and a half years old. And yes, I did have an interaction. And I remembered it very clearly. Um, one of the most craziest interactions. And then my mother came back and made me the meal and said, oh, I don't have to go back to work this afternoon. I'll look after you. So if you understand the way I've, I've come up, then you'll understand that it was easier for me to make that leap to accept what was happening. Um, you know, this, this is my reality. This is, this is what I believe to be true. Um, you know, and, and anybody else can have their reality. And I wouldn't even dream of, of saying that somebody else was wrong um, or to criticize them because, you know, if you're going to go forward and put your head on the chopping block, and I'm a politician for goodness sake, you know, I'm an elected representative of the people. And if I'm going to make these statements, then I must have some credibility, otherwise I'd be sh removed from office. And I wouldn't dream of saying my view is right and everybody else's is wrong, because no, there's lots that go on. I'll just quickly, quickly touch on this. Can I just say I'm not saying that, Simon? That's I'm not that, saying that. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying to you. I'm just saying generally, because um, I, I have a case uh, of a young woman who has definitely uh, had mind control, and she is being got at by humans and the technical term is my lab and what they're doing is is giving her false images she thinks that she's being visited by aliens but the whole object is unfortunately to make her commit suicide and in a mash we had a very difficult case before christmas where another young woman did commit suicide um so scott's absolutely right in many cases there are some despicable humans behind this Thank you. So what, what was you trying to say then, Scott? Because we've only got a couple of minutes left, but they're going to go into the the Ark City radio chill-out hours, and um, <laughs> you're both more than welcome to come on, and it will be a group chat between uh, quite a few of us. And yeah, tonight yes, it's going to be quite an interesting one by the look of the chat room and everything. Um, but what, what was you trying to say then, Scott? Because you said that's not what you're trying to say. No, well, what... Okay. You're going to have to refresh me a bit more on that. I've, I've had hardly no sleep last night, mate. I've been literally... Um, I've, I've had a difficult time trying to get to sleep, let's put it this way. So I'm holding my eyes open with cocktail sticks at the moment. I can't even remember what I was what I was saying five minutes ago, so I, I do apologise. What, what I do want to say is... Uh, that was it. Simon, I'm, I'm not... So, you are entitled to your truth. You are 100% entitled to your truth. And I wouldn't take your truth away from you as long as it is your truth, okay? What, what I am trying to say is maybe, just maybe, there is a chance that our minds can fill in the blanks of an experience quite easily. Um, now, I, if I remember rightly, it was um, September time, mid-September, and you came into Opus when you joined Opus, and you, you stated that you needed to uh, see a hypnotherapist uh, P.S. Is there anyone with mantid and reptilian experiences? I think that was right. Um, so you, you knew what the mantis were. You knew what the reptilians were. You, know, you knew what the mantis were called. Um, and then next thing I, I hear, this, these are just the things that I want, I want to iron these sheets, mate, because there's a few creases in your story that I just want to iron out so that I'm comfortable in my mind. Please don't but think this, I'm this, this, sound, this sounds a little bit like a bit of an attack, Scott. What's up? No, with no, 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 it's not. These are creases that I want ironing out, okay? Because you, you want you're, ironing. you're telling me that these, these things are 100% the truth, okay? And you, won't you, you said to me that I'm entitled to my truth. Why do you want yes. to exercise? Hey, hey, guys, guys, no, sorry no. to interject. <laughs> We're going to roll into a tube, but yeah, I think, this I think is going to have to carry on into the... I think we should an end there. No, well, Simon, what I'm trying to say to you is, is that you then turn around to Dave Hodrian and explain these beings, and Dave Hodrian told you who they were, and and that was that's correct. I, well, I'm just wondering how you came in before you met Dave Hodrian, and you're asking about mantis in, in the Opus Support Group because I've already spoken to Dave Hodrian before then. Right. Well, Dave Hodrian's given me the wrong dates, and there's, uh, that's no problem. I, this this is a thing that I wanted ironed out. Um, so there you go. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll have a chat with Dave. He's obviously given me the wrong wrong date. So. Yeah, you Thank do. You that. Very Cheers. Thank you, Tom. No worries. Um, right, as I was saying, we we're going to roll into a couple of tunes, and then it's straight into the 
Dark City crew chill out area and you're both more than welcome because it's been a really busy night and um, Simon thank you very much for it's such a pleasure. A interesting a pleasure. show and Scott thank you very much and you're both welcome in a moment thank you cheers Dom Simon no no, but no our feelings mate I just wanted to get that one straight yeah that's fine thank you